Thank you for joining us on Synthesis Workshop. In today's installment of our Advanced Organic Chemistry course, we're joined by Dr. Mark Campbell. Mark has previously joined us to discuss his work on alkene dicarbofunctionalization, but I'll briefly reintroduce him now. Mark did his undergrad at Kent State University in the labs of professors Paul Sampson and Alex Seed. Afterwards, he earned his doctorate at UPenn in the group of Professor Gary Molander, where he focused on dual photoredox nickel catalysis. Currently, he's a scientist at Janssen in Springhouse, Pennsylvania. Today, we'll be continuing our transition metal catalysis module as Mark gives us an overview of organonickel catalysis. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Mark. Thank you, Matt, for the introduction and for the opportunity to present on this special episode of Synthesis Workshop. Today, we will be exploring organonickel catalysis, which is a topic of increasing interest in the field of modern synthetic organic chemistry. A quick overview of the topics that will be covered in this lecture. We will begin by comparing nickel and palladium in cross-couplings. We'll then examine some of the fundamental concepts governing the reactivity of organonickel species. And then we'll dive into specific examples of nickel-mediated transformations, partitioning them into one of two classes based on their redox mechanisms. So let's begin. In the modern era of organic chemistry, the term cross-coupling is almost synonymous with palladium, and rightfully so. The discovery of palladium-mediated coupling reactions revolutionized the way chemists think about forming carbon-carbon bonds, and the popularity of these methods has skyrocketed since the turn of the century. However, until recently, the concept of using a nickel catalyst to form carbon-carbon bonds was a rather foreign concept. Historically, chemists have viewed nickel as a rather unruly metal, and as these quotes suggest, many assumed that nickel would never be able to match the utility of palladium. Even the origin of their names seemed to pit nickel as the black sheep compared to palladium. The word nickel is derived from the name of the ore from which it was first isolated, a compound German word, kupfer meaning copper, and nickel which was a slang term for the Christian devil or Satan. On the other hand, palladium gets its name from the Greek word palace, which was another name for Athena, the goddess of wisdom. Despite these diametrically opposite origins, nickel and palladium both possess remarkably useful reactivity in organometallic catalysis, stemming from their unique properties. Both nickel and palladium are transition metals, found in the 10th row of the periodic table, indicating that they both possess 10 d electrons. However, when comparing these elements, we find subtle differences that have major implications for their distinct reactivity. Nickel is less electronegative than palladium, and thus will experience faster oxidative addition with aryl halides due to the buildup of positive charge at the metal center in the transition state. Conversely, palladium undergoes more facile reductive elimination because of its ability to stabilize the partial negative charge in that transition state. Nickel is a smaller atom than palladium and is thus a harder Lewis acid. One important manifestation of this is nickel's high affinity for alkenes. The eta-2 complex formed between nickel and ethylene exhibits much shorter and stronger carbon-to-metal bonds than that of palladium. Accordingly, there are an amazing variety of nickel-catalyzed alkene functionalizations that we will explore later on. Finally, palladium's oxidation states are mainly restricted to zero and plus two. However, because nickel has a more stable open-shell electron configuration, it can access a variety of oxidation states resulting in a myriad of possible redox cycles. This critical aspect of nickel's redox chemistry renders it as a privileged metal for radical cross-coupling reactions. Examining the d orbitals of nickel and their corresponding geometries, we see that the octahedral configuration splits the d orbitals into two groups, two that have sigma bonding character with the axial ligands, and three that have pi bonding to the equatorial ligands. The molecular orbitals of the square planar geometry are more complicated, 
As the orbitals which lie on the x and y axes rise in energy, while those on the z axis fall. Finally, the configuration for the tetrahedral complex is essentially the inverse of the octahedral. Here we see that the sigma orbitals are now stabilized because they are at a distance from the ligands, whereas the pi orbitals are higher in energy because they have direct overlap with each of the ligands. The mechanisms of nickel catalyzed reactions are composed of many of the elementary steps that are found in palladium catalysis, including oxidative addition, reductive elimination, migratory insertion, and beta hydride elimination. Seen here are some of the most common ligands and ligand classes for nickel and their corresponding abbreviations. Though there are a variety of phosphine-based ligands used in conjunction with both palladium and nickel, there are many more nitrogen-based ligand scaffolds found in organonickel chemistry. As we begin to explore some of the specific nickel-catalyzed transformations, we'll first examine those that operate via two electron mechanisms. All of the classical sp2-sp2 cross-coupling nucleophiles, including organozincs, grignards, boronates, and stannanes, that are used with palladium can also be integrated into nickel catalysis with a wide range of competent electrophiles. So, the obvious question is, in which instances would nickel be a more attractive catalyst than palladium? Comparatively, palladium cross-couplings can be run at low catalyst loadings, more moderate temperatures, display excellent functional group tolerance, and, given their extensive study, there's an amazing diversity of ligand scaffolds available. However, nickel is much more earth-abundant and orders of magnitude less expensive than palladium. And, perhaps most importantly, nickel offers a broader scope of accessible coupling partners. To demonstrate this, recall that nickel has a faster rate of oxidative addition than palladium due to its lower electronegativity. This results in a wide range of functional groups that can be activated for cross-coupling by nickel. For example, aryl fluorides have been demonstrated to be competent electrophiles in Nagishi and Kumada couplings. In the first example from the scope of this Nagishi reaction, we see that the coupling of 4 fluoroanisole with paratolyl zinc chloride gave excellent yields under nickel catalysis and only trace product with palladium. Furthermore, nickel can undergo oxidative addition with benzylic esters, ethers, and even alcohols in Suzuki and Kumada type couplings. A very unique example of nickel's ability to undergo oxidative addition is found in the Nagishi coupling with aziridines as electrophiles. Tossel and mesyl protected aziridines produce the beta aryl sulfonamide product. However, this regiochemistry can be flipped when using the so called sinsol directing group, which contains a conjugated alkene that coordinates to the nickel catalyst and directs the regioselectivity in the oxidative addition step. Epoxides have also been shown to undergo oxidative addition under nickel catalysis. The Doyle group developed a highly regioselective Suzuki coupling of styrene oxides with aryl boronic acids. Nickel catalysis was uniquely effective for activating these epoxides, as no reaction was observed with palladium salts. The observed regiochemical outcome of this coupling can be explained by the following mechanism, which begins with a nickel catalyzed ring opening isomerization to yield the corresponding phenyl acetaldehyde. Reinsertion leads to a three-membered oxanicola cycle, which would undergo transmetallation with the boronic acid, followed by reductive elimination to yield the observed benzylic alcohol. Finally, a unique sp2 coupling of two aryl electrophiles developed by the WEX group which showcased the potential of synergistic nickel-palladium bimetallic catalysis. The cross-coupling selectivity hinged upon the differential rates of oxidative addition for various aryl electrophiles with nickel and palladium. 
The researchers established that aryl triflates and aryl bromides showed selective oxidative addition to palladium and nickel, respectively. Transmetallation of the aryl bromide fragment yielded the bis aryl palladium 2 species, which then underwent reductive elimination to furnish the product, while the nickel 2 salt was reduced via a zinc additive. Now let's turn our attention to the use of sp3 coupling partners under nickel and palladium catalysis. The following palladium mediated Suzuki reaction with isopropyl trifluoroborate produced equimolar amounts of the anticipated branched product as well as a linear regioisomer. Let's look at the mechanism to understand how this linear byproduct is formed. After oxidative addition of the aryl chloride and transmetallation of the trifluoroborate, we arrive at the organopalladium species, which is primed for reductive elimination. However, in this complex, there is the possibility to undergo beta-hydride elimination, because the alkyl fragment contains an sp3 carbon, which is beta to the palladium center. After this beta-hydride elimination, the palladium hydride will then reinsert into the ligated alkene positioning the palladium at the more stable primary position of the alkyl fragment. Reductive elimination from this intermediate then produces the observed regioisomeric byproduct. Given that these types of beta-hydride eliminations are prevalent in sp2-sp3 couplings, it's not surprising that the selectivity of sp3-sp3 couplings is exceptionally difficult under palladium catalysis. In the Kumata coupling of N-butyl magnesium chloride and 1-bromodecane, use of palladium chloride as the catalyst only afforded 38% of the desired product, with a wide range of byproducts stemming from undesired beta-hydride elimination. However, the same reaction under nickel catalysis gave a near-quantitative yield of the desired product. So what are the key differences that enable nickel to facilitate this sp3-sp3 coupling? First, beta-hydride elimination is innately slower with organonickel species compared to palladium. Let's take a closer look as to why this is true. In a computational analysis of the heck coupling of vinyl bromide with ethylene, we see that the last steps of this mechanism involve beta-hydride elimination from the primary organometallic species. To access the transition state for beta-hydride elimination, the organometallic intermediate must adopt what is termed a beta-agostic complex. Essentially what this means is that the two electrons involved in the CH bond, beta to the metal center, are donated into the empty d orbital of the transition metal resulting in a three-center, two-electron bond. From the computed reaction coordinates, we see that the energy required for the organonickel complex to access this beta-agostic interaction is much higher than the corresponding organopalladium species. This is attributed to the higher strain in the organonickel species due to the shorter nickel-carbon bonds, and the differences in d orbital energies of nickel and palladium centers. In addition to the inherently slower rate of beta hydride elimination in organonickel species, the ligand also plays a vital role in the success of the nickel catalyzed sp3 sp3 coupling. In the presence of a nickel zero species, butadiene undergoes a dimerization to yield a macro nickel cycle. This unique ligand provides conformational restraints that prevent the formation of the beta-agostic interaction required for beta-hydride elimination. Therefore, the coupling proceeds through reductive elimination from the dialkyl organonickel species to yield the product. Nickel catalysis has also been leveraged to achieve sp3-sp3 coupling with more challenging secondary alkyl fragments. In this Nagishi coupling, we see the privileged efficacy of nickel rather than palladium to achieve the desired product. Additionally, 
The identity of the ligand was critical to achieve the desired regioisomer. Similar to the previous example, this tridentate pi box ligand was required as it restricts the conformation of the intermediate organonickel species to retard the rate of beta hydride elimination. As seen in this scope, the use of organozinc species, which are less reactive than other organometallic nucleophiles, exhibited excellent functional group tolerance. In addition to standard cross coupling reactions, nickel is also effective at catalyzing other carbon carbon bond formations such as hydroalkylation of Michael acceptors with alkyl halides. This is a remarkable improvement over classical Michael additions, which typically require more reactive organometallic nucleophiles for carbon-carbon bond formation. This strategy was used in the late stages of the total synthesis of calcitriol and displayed excellent chemoselectivity in the presence of several other conjugated alkenes. In addition to hydroalkylation, this paradigm can be leveraged to accomplish dicarbofunctionalization of activated alkenes by stabilizing the intermediate with an additive such as zinc. The resulting zinc enoate functions as a nucleophile in an aldol type reaction with an aldehyde to yield the corresponding beta hydroxy ester. To round out our discussion of two electron mechanisms, now let's examine a more unique species in nickel catalysis, nickel hydride. Nickel hydrides are species that contain one or more nickel hydrogen bonds. These organometallic complexes are somewhat unstable and typically require specialized ligands, such as the tridentate pincer type ligands seen here. Unsurprisingly, nickel hydrides are excellent reagents for alkene or alkyne hydrogenation. However, these complexes are also able to affect other modes of carbon-carbon and carbon-heteroatom bond formation. For example, nickel hydride can catalyze a reductive cross-coupling between activated and unactivated alkenes. Nickel hydride preferentially undergoes insertion into the more activated styrene or conjugated alkene with the observed regioselectivity. Ligation of the unactivated alkene, followed by carbonicylation, gives the primary organonickel species, which then undergoes beta-hydride elimination to yield the desired product and regenerate the catalytic nickel hydride. Finally, a very unique mode of nickel hydride reactivity, termed chain walking, involves iterative alkene insertion and subsequent beta-hydride elimination to access the most stable organonickel species. These reactions achieve functionalization at remote sites from the original position of the alkene as the nickel apparently walks across an alkyl fragment to achieve a resting state at the most stabilized position. The regioselectivity can be determined by electronics, such as a benzylic position, or sterics, which typically functionalize a primary position. Here we see a select range of possible remote alkene functionalizations achieved via nickel hydride chain walking. Now let's turn our attention to catalytic mechanisms which involve single electron species. These can be grouped into two general classes based on the method of radical formation. First are those which utilize a metal or additive to perform single electron reduction of some carbon electrophile. These strategies utilize abundant precursors, such as alkyl halides and activated carboxylic acids. However, they do require a careful orchestration of rates, elevated temperatures, and often suffer from proto-defunctionalization byproducts. Alternatively, Photoredox catalysis can be employed to generate radical fragments that feed into nickel coupling cycles. These reactions can activate either reductive or oxidatively generated radical precursors. Additionally, the rates of these reactions are well defined as both catalytic cycles work synergistically to regulate one another. The major drawbacks 
are that these methods are often very difficult to run on scale and usually require photocatalysts, which are noble metal-based coordination complexes. Let's first examine some modes of catalysis that fall under the first class of reactions. Nickel salts have been demonstrated to achieve intramolecular alkene difunctionalization in the presence of zinc reductants. The mechanism of this transformation begins with the reduction of the alkyl halide by low valent nickel. The resulting primary radical then undergoes 5 exotrig cyclization with the pendant alkene. Methylation of this methyl cyclopentyl radical assists in the ultimate transmetallation with zinc to produce an alkyl zinc which can be functionalized with a wide range of various electrophiles. One such example is found in the total synthesis of methyl jasminate, a derivative of jasmonic acid which is an essential plant hormone found in many trees including the Japanese fig pictured here. In this total synthesis, the organozinc species produced from the nickel catalyzed cyclization is directly submitted to a sonogashira coupling with an alkynyl bromide to complete the alkene difunctionalization. One of the most popular reactions in modern organonickel chemistry is the sp3-sp2 coupling of aryl and alkyl electrophiles. The proposed mechanism of this reaction begins with oxidative addition of the nickel zero species with the aryl halide. Metallation of the radical fragment leads to the nickel-3 intermediate, which readily undergoes reductive elimination. The nickel-1 species then functions as a single electron reductant to fragment the alkyl halide, producing another equivalent of alkyl radical. The cycle is then completed as an exogenous reductant, such as manganese, turns over the nickel catalyst. This reaction is quite remarkable given that no dimerization products are observed under these conditions. Further mechanistic experiments have shed some light on the origin of selectivity in this cross-coupling. First, an organonickel species produced from the oxidative addition with the alkyl halide was submitted to the reaction and only yielded the alkane dimer with no cross-coupled product observed indicating that this is not a productive intermediate in the reaction. Computational analysis demonstrated that oxidative addition, rather than single electron reduction, is the preferred pathway for the nickel zero species, confirming that this is the resting state of the catalyst. Taken together, these analyses provide strong support for the proposed mechanism. Finally, let's turn our attention to nickel photoredox dual catalytic mechanisms. In a typical coupling reaction, using an oxidatively generated radical precursor, the excited state photocatalyst undergoes reductive quenching to produce the alkyl radical, which will eventually enter the cross-coupling cycle. The nickel zero species first undergoes oxidative addition into the aryl halide. Photochemical excitation of this nickel-2 complex results in square planar to tetrahedral isomerization, which is critical for the success of this coupling. The alkyl radical will then approach this tetrahedral nickel complex from a pseudo-equatorial position, leading to a trigonal bipyramidal nickel-3 intermediate. The cis relationship between the metallated alkyl and aryl fragments is essential for the reductive elimination to generate the desired product. Finally, both cycles are regenerated via single electron transfer between the reduced state photocatalyst and nickel-1 species. Bipyridal nickel complexes are excellent catalysts for these transformations when employing primary and secondary carbon-centered radicals. However, no desired coupling occurs when using acyclic tertiary radicals in conjunction with bipyridal ligands. Interestingly, this tertiary coupling can be accomplished using an anionic ligand, such as ACAC. Computational analyses of these catalytic systems has provided insight into the differential reactivity of these ligands. In the bipyridine system, Nickel-0 undergoes oxidative addition into the aryl halide, 
followed by photochemical square planar to tetrahedral isomerization. However, once the tertiary radical is methylated, the resulting nickel-3 intermediate is unable to undergo reductive elimination due to steric constraints. Ultimately, the complex is left to equilibrate between these nickel-2 and nickel-3 intermediates. Alternatively, when employing an anionic ligand, the catalytic cycle begins with a nickel-1 species. Thus, oxidative addition produces a nickel-3 intermediate. In this instance, the radical will not be methylated to produce a nickel-4 intermediate, as these are highly unstable species, but rather forms a complex with the pi system of the arene and proceeds to the desired product via an outer sphere reductive elimination. Nickel catalysis has also been used in conjunction with photoredox to accomplish CH activation. In a method developed by the Doyle group, nickel catalysis is responsible for the formation of chloride radicals, which can perform homolysis of activated CH bonds to ultimately achieve alpha aerylation of ethers. In the proposed mechanism, the oxidative addition complex undergoes single electron oxidation via the excited state iridium photocatalyst to produce a nickel-3 species. This unstable intermediate releases chloride radical, returning the nickel to its plus-2 oxidation state. The chloride radical is then responsible for generating the alkyl radical via hydrogen atom abstraction of the activated alpha-alkoxy CH bond. The resulting radical is methylated, and the complex undergoes reductive elimination to yield the product, while the nickel-1 species engages in single electron transfer with the reduced state photocatalyst. We covered a lot of ground in this lecture, but we've really just begun to delve into the ever-expanding field of organonickel catalysis. Listed here are some of the most thorough books and review articles on the subject of nickel catalysis for further reading. Again, I'd like to thank Matt for this opportunity to present on Synthesis Workshop, and I hope we've all learned some very unique aspects of organonickel chemistry. Thank you, Mark, for a very interesting talk, which really conveyed a lot of central themes in nickel chemistry. In our next episode, we'll continue with this module. See you next time.